Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Specifying Practice Group webinar. Our topic for today is Manufacturer Specs, Opportunities, and Pitfalls, and this is actually a continuation of that discussion from last month. Our thought leaders are David Stutzman and Louis Metcalf. David is a registered architect, certified construction specifier, and founding principal of Conspectus, a specifications and quality assurance consulting firm. Lewis is an architect and certified construction specifier. Lewis manages the specifications and quality assurance programs for Gresham Smith & Partners, a national architecture, engineering, interiors, and planning firm. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. <clears throat> Your participation during today's webinar is encouraged, and we have allowed time to take questions throughout the presentation. Although attendee audio lines are muted, you may click the raise hand button to indicate that you have a question or comment. We will identify you by name and unmute your line, at which point you may begin speaking. If you're participating via streaming audio and do not have a computer microphone, you may also type your question into the chat box. Now, Dave and Lewis, over to you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Dave Stutzman coming to you from uh, beautiful southern New Jersey. Uh, Lewis uh, from uh, Tennessee. And uh, we have a special guest with us, a continuation uh, since this is part second. Uh, Phil Cobbs is with us today, too, from uh, uh, Spec Guy. Phil, you want to say hello to everyone and introduce yourself a little bit? Delighted to be here and also delighted to have the mute button on my phone off now. And uh, uh, pleased to be looking out on sunny uh, North Carolina skies here in Charlotte where the, um, the phlox, the azalea, and the uh, dogwood are all in bloom. So those of you who are located in northern climates, I'll let you know the robins have been through here. They're on their way to you. Um, have faith. Bring you the <laughs> Oh, uh, thanks, Phil. I appreciate that. Uh, the weather update here and the spring forecast. That's great. That's right. All in one. In one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What what we want to do since we broke off in midstream last month is I'm going to start out with just a brief recap of where we were, and then we're going to dive into our discussion of part two. Phil's going to go over uh, essentially the first part of that, which I think we covered some of last time around. So he'll go through that rather quickly and then start in on the new material that you folks have to see. So last month, if you recall, we, made, we polled our group and we found out uh, that most of everyone that was on the call is using manufacturer's guide specs frequently, uh, that they're really relying on them as information for writing spec sections from scratch. They're not necessarily using the manufacturer's specs as they are provided. When they are using the manufacturer's specs, it's, everyone agreed that they're doing it with some pretty major editing to the specifications. And most everybody agreed, too, that they're adding uh, competing products or competing manufacturers because most manufacturers are not including that kind of information in the specifications that they produce. We went over some of the areas as to why uh, manufacturers are actually producing their own specifications. Some of it's marketing. Uh, some of it's to establish some limitations on liability. Uh, very little of it's actually to name competition. Uh, but the, the kinds of things that manufacturers are writing into their specs can have a direct effect on the outcome, and certainly architects, specifiers, designers have to be aware of what uh, the manufacturers are writing into the specifications and whether or not it's suitable for their own projects. The one thing that we said or we discussed was that could give you a clue about the veracity of some of the manufacturer specs, uh, be looking at the formatting uh, that they're using. If it's master format 1995, that should give you a clue that it's at least seven years old since 2004 was introduced. Uh, if they're not using the current section format, uh, which is most recognizable by uh, performance data now appearing in part two instead of part one, uh, it also gives you a clue that it, the section is at least several years old. And uh, I think 
the other major thing that uh, the group was discussing last time was the gotcha clauses. And since Phil's here and since uh, Phil deals with actually writing many manufacturer specs and is providing sort of a different point of view from those of us that are producing project specs, I think on that note, I think I want to turn this over to Phil and let him start into part two and the discussion there. So, Phil, you're on. I hope your mute button is off. I'm on, and the mute button is not lit. Aha. Uh -huh. Good start. So, so that's a good start, and, and we'll kind of start right where uh, David left off, and, and, and that is um, the, the, the gotcha issue, which is a, is, a, is a problem for specifiers from time to time. And it's also a problem for those of us that work with manufacturers to, to reach an understanding of the difference between um, providing information on salient characteristics. And of course, because this is a specifier audience, we all know what I mean by that, I trust. That is, um, is, is are, are the items that are detailed in the specification important or not? And uh, in, in this and are they important to this specific project? Exactly right. And are they important to, to the designer, who sometimes is the specifier, uh, but sometimes isn't? And so those of, of you who are providing specification writing service but are not serving as the project designer, you, it's a reminder to go back to the designer and make sure you understand why this particular product that, that you're likely looking at uh, in you know brochure and guide spec form uh, is desired. As in, what, what did you have in mind? What were you thinking when you chose this? But that there there may be you know aspects of that particular product that are are really quite essential to the design intent, which means that you want to make sure that you have included you know those particular characteristics in the specification. Now. What happens if, in doing that, you have essentially closed the specification? Uh, and the, you know this this next uh, you know uh, couple comments is, is is one which is part of a conversation I have with fellow specifiers and and with our our manufacturer clients all the time. Um, it it is Im embedded in architects and specifiers minds that they must provide um, three comparable products uh, in a specification in order to properly specify it. And I'd like to point out that uh, in, in my humble opinion, this is not necessarily the case. Uh, what we really are called to do is to specify design intent. And you know that may be uh, that, that intent may be a little bit fluid around the edges, but you need to know how fluid it is. Um, you know, to to what extent, uh, you know, do you do you detail the specification of, of a product? And and when you are shutting out all other products in the market, um, is that your intent, or is the in, intent there to meet a project need? Uh, and we have an interesting way of approaching this under North Carolina uh, state public bidding laws, where if there is a defensible reason to close the specification, it simply has to be done publicly. So we we announce that in in a, in a meeting announcement, usually along with the the uh, the pre bid meeting, and we uh, give the opportunity for the public to comment to the agency owner on whether or not that's something that you should do. Um, so there can be reasons to close the specification to a particular manufacturer that are very defensible from a design point of view. And, and so the, um, the lockouts, as uh, manufacturer salespeople call them, those little things that are embedded in the specification um, sometimes are a good thing. I recommend to manufacturers that if there is something about their product that really does exclude comparables in, in some projects, that they point it out. That they actually add a specifier's note and says, you know, 
this this you know this thing in the next paragraph is a real good thing. <laughs> we make our product like this on purpose because we think that it serves a need, um, and here's what that need is. Um, so, um, so you know, so much on that, and you're going to find these types of issues in manufacturers, but it's why they write them. Right. But, One thing that everyone could watch out for, Phil, too, is some of the the terms that end up being used that make a specification closed. Uh, the the one that I can think of offhand is in master spec where it provi where the in part two it specifies provide the following or provide one of the following essentially closes the spec. Yeah. So you can watch out for those kinds of terms where it limits uh, the specification to specific list or a single product. Yeah, those um, we 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 sometimes in project specifications where we have one product in mind, but uh, aren't just aren't able to do exhaustive research. We'll use a kind of what I call a modified basis of design approach, where we list a manufacturer, and then we indicate that that. Uh, uh, um, you know, comparable products may be acceptable, but must be submitted prior to bid, uh, which gives the really the original design team more control over what else might be approved. Whereas leaving leaving comparison of comparable products until during construction may mean that a set of submittals is getting approved in a job trailer by a, a, a contract administrator and and never gets back. To the specifier or the or the design architect who had made the original selection, that language, um, how the question being, how free is the contractor to shop, is very important language in in every specification section. Wasn't that a beautiful segue? I didn't realize you were going to be there, and here we are. It, it, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're free right to shop. there. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was perfect, and it kind of got me off of that. Uh, okay. That ramble I was on there. So. Uh, I'm just trying to punch. <laughs> I'll try to keep pushing you ahead, Phil. Good. Um, <laughs> substitution restrictions. I think most of us, when we pick up a manufacturer's back and see that line that says substitutions are are not allowed, uh, I think the hair stands up on the back of our uh, of our neck. Um, I, I, you know, I that that is seldom the intent of an owner. It is once in a while, um, but I I uh, I encourage people to to not state it in that fashion, but rather to, uh, to you know to indicate that we want the architect in control of any any substitution um, request. Well, the other thing is that manufacturers when they put stuff in uh, guide specifications about substitution restrictions and procedures generally are are uh, conflicting with what you've probably got in your division one spec about substitution procedures so that's something to always look out for and uh, and to make sure that you uh, either delete it or uh, make it work with what you've already uh, written in your division one uh, very good point, and, and being a great fan of Division One, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Lewis, because uh, so many projects seem to be going out the door of architectural firms without the architect writing Division One, um, and that might be the subject someday of an, of another whole webinar. Um, we don't like that. <laughs> Uh, comparable manufacturers and products. Uh, did the rep suggest some? Uh, uh, did he did he suggest some that are extremely high priced or are only marketed on the island of Guam? Uh, you might want to check that out and see are they are they really viable? Um, hopefully they are. Hopefully that if they've suggested some, they are good products and they are uh, competitive in in the in the project region. Um, you had best double check them. There's there's no better thing uh, that the specifier can do than to just jump over to the website, grab the product data sheet, line the three of them up, and and get a look at them and be, uh, you know, reasonably conversant in, in in what you're listing in the spec. 
you know, one of the other things too, Phil, that I, I find is a good help, if you know uh, good product reps of the other manufacturers that someone is suggesting, send the draft spec to them. They've probably seen the spec before and they are probably going to be the ones to spot the gotcha clauses. <laughs> good idea. Good idea. And I think we owe that to our owners. I was looking at a guide specification the other day and it was for roof insulation, um, which is kind of a tricky spec because an awful, awful lot of uh, roof insulation is specified right in the roofing section, but uh, I know a lot of federal specs do not do that. And, and you can specify roof insulation as a standalone spec if you want. But what I, what I asked the manufacturer is why did they have every single thickness and size of every insulation that they make listed in this spec? Um, so I guess my comment is more uh, one of commiserating with those of you who try to use those sort of documents that they're, they're, that information belongs on a data sheet, not spec. And so, you know, what you want to do is you want to remove those things you don't need to say in the specification and, and leave in those things that, that are important. And, and uh, as you, you know, more familiar you are with the product, of course, the more you're able to do that. Uh, the manufacturer tends to load up their guide spec with every piece of test data and physical characteristics that they can think of you may want to whittle it back to just those things that matter. And you may also, when you see a guide spec that says that uh, uh, you want a, a, a modified bit uh, base sheet that has 237 pounds of pencil strength, you know, 200 may be just fine. <laughs> or maybe you really have your heart set on 225. But uh, 237, probably, you know, rounding off and having kind of reasonable range of acceptable numbers um, is appropriate. Yeah, some, sometimes when you get into those really the detailed exactly what it is, like you say, 237 pounds, that could very well put you as a proprietary spec sure. because they're going to engineer the material so that it is just above the competition. You put that in, nobody else can meet it. And, and that is the other reason for pulling a few other manufacturers' data sheets. Uh, because you, you can always uh, do that with, with a, a large number of the products we specified. You can always engineer to shut out other, other manufacturers who may come in you know, with a thickness or a density or a strength of 10% below that, and it may be perfectly adequate for the project. Okay, well, let's take a jump to uh, product description. Uh, we've talked about there. Yeah, there's a good example. Oh, there. Yeah, there's your example. Every thickness and every size of of uh, option uh, information, which especially like. since some of those uh, that information, like thickness and depth, are really uh, generally a drawing information. Yeah. Yeah. So let's move ahead and talk for a minute about product. Uh, Let's see, performance requirement. There we are. Performance criteria. Um, you may need to do a little editing in this area, even even uh, uh, you know when when just borrowing information from the manufacturer's guide spec. Uh, seldom is the person who really understands uh, the difference between physical and chemical characteristics and actual true performance requirements, the one who's writing that, that guide spec. So you, you do find a certain scrambling of information sometimes. And, and again, as you become more familiar as a specifier with the difference between these characteristics, uh, the more you're likely to be uh, doing a lot of uh, quick cutting and pasting to move things where they belong. With performance criteria, you also have to look out for regional issues. Um, obviously, if we were looking at a manufacturer's spec for storefront or curtain wall, um, 
the requirements uh, for Dade County in South Florida uh, as opposed to uh, Maine or Central Texas or someplace uh, would be quite different. And, uh, and, and so you would have to adjust whatever information the, with respect to performance criteria or performance requirements that the manufacturer gave as guides to tailor it to your specific project in that specific part of the, of the country. You'd kind of hate to be in the position of getting a phone call on a spec that you put out for uh, a, a barracks project in El Paso and have the rep wondering why it is that you had hurricane high wind design requirements. <laughs> <laughs> You'd see it would be embarrassing, uh, almost embarrassing as uh, finding out you didn't have the force protection requirements that uh, the Army wants in there. So, um, yes, you, you have to be selective about the information. Uh, some manufacturers' guide specs have some guidance in the form of notes. Some of them don't have the notes where it is you really need them. Um, you know, and, a, and a lot of us might be approaching a product from the first for the first time. We're not all that uh, uh, you know, up to snuff on some of the issues involved with it. When that's the case, um, you know, try to give yourself another half hour. Go visit ASTM's website. Uh, do a quick search on their, the standards that that's being um, uh, referred to in, in the guide spec. If you're not familiar with it, and just read the cover sheet of the standard, even if you don't buy it and download it. Uh, just become a little bit more knowledgeable about, um, you know, w what it is you're specifying. Um, material standards, generally manufacturers' specifications are going to do a reasonable job of this. There's a, there's a product engineer involved somewhere there who knows what they're buying and what they're making their product out of. Um, sustainability characteristics are the appropriate to the to the project, well, are they? The first question is, are they appropriate to the product? Uh, I asked a, a roof insulation manufacturer the other day, uh, what was it? It was, yeah, you know, whether you know, they had the the. Um, oh, I'm I'm not remembering now. I, I think it was the recycled content requirement. Which, which really, is in, in this particular case, just wasn't it wasn't appropriate to the product. There was no mention of it in part two, but it was listed under submittal. And I think somebody wasn't quite on top of of how all of that worked, and and, and a lot of manufacturers are still struggling with this. So you're 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 going to have to know more about lead requirements than they do. But before we go to the next one, I think we have a, uh, Rob, don't we have a question from our good friend Sheldon Wolf? Uh, no, no, actually, he was just, uh, he was just coming, oh, okay. we had some background noise, but he just wanted to let us know about okay. that. Okay, one, one thing you mentioned, Phil, was about the product stand or the reference standards. I find that in having maintained spec text, just as an example, uh, ASTM is by far and away the most referenced uh, set of standards that if we account for all of the references in the Spectex libraries, ASTM accounts for about 80% of those references. So what I do is I rely on the annual publication, uh, the compilation that they have, which is a four volume book uh, available that includes all of the standards referenced by spec text, spec link, master spec, and the codes. So it's a great resource and actually I think it's relatively inexpensive if you especially if you consider buying all of those individually. It, that's a great resource and even if you say you're going to buy it every two or three years um, and then just double check to see if if a question comes up on something, you know, that you might buy in between. It, it, right. it is really a great resource, and, and it's it, it's complete enough to support most of what we're doing. So, um, 
Um, and, and by the way, another thing about the G is the standard up-to-date question that is always being raised. One thing to bear in mind is that the, the um, how critical a, a recent update in ASTM standards or other standards varies a great deal from product to product and, you know, and, and application to application. Um, in many of the ASTM standards that appear in our specifications are there because the building code cites them. And the building code is a slowly changing set of requirements that uh, in any given locale may, you know, may be running three years behind the product update standards that we're looking at. Um, I, I think specifiers encounter very few problems with addition dates of, of uh, um, cited standards. But the manufacturer is well advised to stay, to keep their, their testing and their guide specs up to date. There's nothing more unsettling to me than getting a guide spec from a manufacturer that cites a, a 1987 ASTM standard that hasn't been around since 1995. Uh, that suggests that maybe their quality control program is not so hot. Um, these are not a big deal on accessories, except that there is a problem with, I would say, the majority of, of manufactured guide specs that are out there these days. That is, you cannot spec a complete project with them. They will list those things that they make. Right. But, but they will almost uniformly not include accessory items which the contractor must supply that are required for the complete installation but aren't made by the manufacturer. And uh, I, I have this conversation with our clients all of the time and I say, well, we just need to just include some generic description of, for instance, the, the secondary framing stuff that you use behind metal wall panels. They're not, that stuff's not made or sold by the metal wall panel manufacturer. They don't want to deal with them. And, and what they're concerned about, and rightfully so, is that, that contractors who, who do a poor job of packaging their bid packages sometimes turn directly back to the manufacturer expecting that, that along with the metal wall panels, the, they're going to be supplying some hat channels. Well, they're not, but that half channel has got to be there somewhere, and it usually appears in the metal wall panel section, and so you need to be a little wary if you're relying on a manufacturer's guide spec that, that you've, you've got the other pieces covered either by adding them in here uh, or somewhere else that's logical. Would you say... Um uh, Phil, that most manufacturers think that a spec section defines the scope of a subcontract rather than, you know, our concept is that it's a convenient uh, arrangement for products. And most of the time, we don't care who puts the stuff in. Oh, absolutely. Or, or, or they have an even more restrictive idea, and that is, you know, if they don't supply the nuts and bolts, they just don't think it should be in the spec at all. Uh, they, they don't understand the concept of the, the work result as we do, as specifiers. Um, some, you know, some are, uh, you know, especially if, if they're working with a, a professional specifier, um, they, they begin to, to understand that and their documents get to be a little more useful. Um, they may not want to see the liability, for instance, of engineering the application of the product. Many manufacturers don't do that. They don't have engineers who have, uh, you know, licensure in Oklahoma and are ready to engineer the application of the product. Uh, the the sub local subcontractor or general contractor has got to find an engineer to do that. 
Um, and, and so they don't want any mention of engineering in their guide spec um, because of that. Well, uh, so you as a specifier, if you're turning to that guide spec, be, uh, be aware of the fact that there are some things in there the manufacturer hasn't wanted to include that you may need to on your project. Okay, where are we headed here? We're getting, uh, thankfully, I'm sure you were all saying, uh, towards the end of part two, uh, <laughs> fabrication, we should have well, we some finishes. Okay. We all know that part two is the heart and soul of any spec section. It really is. So, so guide specifications, um, the, uh, uh, in, in the, in the, in, in the world of finishes then, if we could jump, David, to the next uh, sure. part there. Um, Thanks for that kick. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, by all means, uh, turnabout's fair play. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, you know, the manufacturer wants to, if, if they provide products that have color applied to them, they, they want to guide the, the, uh, the specifier toward the use of their standard colors because they've got big gallons or large rolls of stuff already there and they can be more competitive. Um, so the, the specifier needs, needs to kind of understand the manufacturer's take on, on the range of colors that are available or what happens if there's a custom color and, uh, you know, usually can find some helpful language in, in the manufacturer's spec as a guide uh, to that. Uh, when you're when you're specifying uh, with a guide spec that is a primed product that's come, going to come to the project and have a field uh, uh, paint or coating applied, um, it could take a little bit of coordination work here to make sure that uh, the Division Nine uh, paint or coating section is talking to the primer section here and vice versa. And you may need to add some language there. Um, th that's the kind of thing that a manufacturer is less likely to be savvy about than, than the specifier is. Right. And one thing I like to see in the end of part two, or I guess it goes to part three actually, especially if it's primed finish that you're buying, is make sure you tell them that it has to be field painted. Yes. Don't, Very just, good. Rely, don't just rely on division. Don't make assumptions. <laughs> Very good. And, and, and we can do that without goofing things up by using language like, um, you know, field painting is specified in Division 9 section exterior painting. And that just raises the flag. Aha! Has to be done. So, right. so we, we live through part two and we go on to part three. Well, thanks, Phil. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, thanks for guiding us through that part now, two. Now, 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 Phil, you, yeah. you have to understand that one of the main attractions of this uh, endeavor, this uh, this group, is we try to stump each other. So oh. you are now invited oh, sure. to ask okay. any embarrassing question that we have not previously rehearsed uh, of David as he uh, takes <laughs> off. And, and uh, with any track. with any luck at all, we'll run out of room, <laughs> out of time for me to do part one, so I'll be uh, exempt. I will make sure that doesn't happen. Okay, so part three, talking about examination, I think uh, one of the things that we see oftentimes missing from manufacturer specifications is actually the preparation, the examination of the substrates, uh, because the manufacturers are just wanting to deal with the installation of their product. They're not necessarily concerned about what has to do, what has to be done uh, to prepare the surfaces and they're not necessarily sure or care about uh, excluding information or assigning all of that information or responsibility to others uh, so that they're not taking that on or giving it to their subcontractors. So we need to be careful to include the substrate preparation, the examination, and we need to watch for these phrases in the manufacturer specs where they're excluding the work or where they're assigning it through NIC, uh, meaning that it's their inference is that it's somewhere else in the construction contract 
but if we go back to the coordination with Division One, we know if something's marked NIC, it actually could be excluded from the construction contract. So I think, Rob, we had a, a poll question that relates to this, and we'll see what the um, audience has to say. The first one, do you remove work exclusions? So we'd like your we'd like your opinion on this as to whether or not you're carefully removing these kinds of work exclusions when you see them in a manufacturer's uh, specifications or not. And I see a couple of you say it depends. And if you could uh, type a chat and let us know what you think it depends upon, and we'd like to hear from you. Is that a, it looks like we've got a pretty good response here, and it's nearly split 50-50, uh, that, it, that it's always being removed or that it depends. So, Rob, do we have anybody that's uh, ventured an opinion as to what it means when it depends? Uh, I don't think I don't see any responses in chat yet or in our questions pane. Okay, feel free out there, <laughs> share your opinion because I'd like to know. Okay, I think we could close that poll, Rob. All right. But well, we had about just about fifty percent say yes uh, that you're removing these kinds of requirements. Forty-five percent are out there saying it depends. So. I'm not sure what you're thinking it depends upon, maybe the particular project conditions. We'd like now to I do, see, I do see we have a hand raised. It looks like uh, John Schlageter uh, has a hand raised. I'm going to go ahead and try and unmute you here, John. John, are you there with us? There we are. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, it's okay. No, I punched the wrong button. I was looking for the uh, dialogue to ask the question. So, well, now you're live, John. So here's your chance. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it was just a question of, um, in terms of when we would remove that. It's uh, really driven by the owner's desire to ease or restrict or constrain, you know, the conditions of the project. Sometimes, right. if you make it overly constrained, they perceive that it's going to be cost more than it would otherwise. Right. Well, one of the things I think of when I see these exclusions in the NIC, uh, the classic example for me is elevator specs, where an elevator spec may be 15 pages, and about half of that are exclusions because they don't want to take any responsibility for the shaftway and for the support of the rails and, and a whole bunch of the power that's being brought to the, uh, to the equipment. So I think we need to be careful in many cases that uh, we understand what these work exclusions are. Installation. And most most manufacturers' installation specs are brief, very brief, and it may actually say install it only with the manufacturer's instructions. My question, <coughs> pardon me, my question is, can we rely on that? And I think unless you have actually found the manufacturer's installation instructions and know what they say, I don't know how we can rely on. It. If the manufacturer specs have no more information about installation than to follow the manufacturer's instructions, I think it's incumbent on us to know something more about how the product should be installed and to actually specify what those requirements are going to be. The well, and especially to be able to describe what the end result, what is the, the quality level or, you know, what do we want to see? We want joints evenly spaced and they have a uniform width and hang it straight, screw it tight, that kind of stuff. Right. Plum I, level. Oh, spoken like a true architect. <laughs> you know, what if it's a piece of equipment? Accurately <laughs> lined. <laughs> How about Re running the remove packing equipment or uh, packing uh, uh, materials? <laughs> How about making sure we have the right size water line to service the piece of the equipment? <laughs> <laughs>
I'll go you know, for where that. It's, you know, <laughs> it goes beyond just the looks. So uh, we need to make sure that we have all of those kinds of things covered. So if if you have a manufacturer's product spec that's relying almost entirely on manufacturer's instructions, go to the website, try to find the instructions, see what kinds of things that they have because you may actually find some additional prep work or you might find some coordination work that's required that might be important to include elsewhere in the spec. Okay, and there's all of Lewis's concerns, all of those good architectural things to make it look nice by the time you're all done and to make sure that it stays in place. Of course, we have to anchor it. Okay, and my big, here's my, my uh, big question. What about equipment startup? You know, we as architects or architectural specifiers sometimes forget about the equipment side of it. You know, are we going to be looking for manufacturers to actually help uh, support us in equipment startup? And Rob, were you able to get that second poll question to work? I was not, actually. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, so here's something to think about. If you have uh, manufacturers' field services that you're requesting, especially here for equipment startup, is this something manufacturers field services that you're often requesting? Is it something that you would request for equipment only? Uh, what about uh, for field assembled uh, systems or products such as roofing or uh, a clean room wall and ceiling assembly? Are you looking for manufacturers to actually be out in the field supporting those kinds of products to ensure that they're installed correctly. Many of the product manufacturers' product specs tend to ignore the response of the providing field responsibilities and assisting in the installation. So if it's not there and you're expecting it as a matter of quality control for the project, you need to be sure that you're including the requirements. So then moving on into field quality control, and don't you know, part three is much shorter than part two. I love this, Phil. Because <laughs> I'm, oh, get... I'm sorry, not to interrupt, but before you guys move on, we did have a couple interesting comments. Okay, go ahead. Um, one actually was, was a reply from John, it looks like, as well, and he was saying it, it depends on the owner's desire for easing or restrictive requirements. That was actually a response to the uh, okay. requirements. And then um, let me check here. Uh, Dennis Elrod, pardon me, sent send in a, another interesting comment. He said, as I learned from my mentor, Mr. Metcalf, manufacturer's requirements are often overbearing and a roundabout way of eliminating competition. Lewis, who are you teaching out there? How many, <laughs> how many students do you have? Dennis is an old friend. We uh, worked together at uh, a previous firm for about 12 years, and he's a fine fellow and was asked to uh, take over the, the uh, uh, maintaining the spec masters for the whole company That's after great. I left. Well, thanks for the comment, Dennis. Yeah. Was, was, Good was to hear from you, Dennis. Rob? Yep, there were a couple other comments. Um, Alan it Iskowitz uh, joined in and said, uh, I think the installation instructions are dependent on whether or not the product is a commodity item, such as gypsum board, steel, etc. A very good comment. Yes, that is absolutely right. Well, and, and I would just add to that, too, that if it is a commodity item, uh, you mentioned gypsum board, that often there's an industry standard that can be cited that governs installation of those kinds of products and if you can rely on those industry standards even better. And we have another comment from Byron Vargas who states, uh, just a note, uh, some manufacturers require installers to be certified which aids in rating specifications. Yes, and we'll talk about a little bit about that in part when we get to the part one uh, section here in, in a few minutes. Ah, so you've already made the commitment. That's great. We're going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Okay, I'm holding you to that one, Lois. Okay, the other thing... I have thing, faith in you, David. I have faith all right, in you. All right. The other thing for part three here is the, the <clears> tests and inspections and whether or not uh, we're dealing with the code required special tests and inspections or manufacturer's inspections. And that really relates to the amount of field quality control that you're expecting. And, it, and to me, it's a great deal dependent upon whether or not it's something that's a field fabricated assembly. And we'll go back to roofing as a great example that, you know, it's reliant so much on the mechanics that are actually constructing the roof, especially for a built up or a multi-ply modified bitumen uh, to make sure they get right. So if, if you believe the project warrants it and just make sure that you're including the inspections whether it be the special test by code or the manufacturer's inspections. The remainder, I think, of part three is really just, to me, a lot of this is common sense. If we have a product that's especially sensitive to damage and if it goes in earlier than the last minute of a construction project right before turnover, Yes, we need to be talking about cleaning and protecting the product, make sure that it's not damaged by other construction operations. Uh, beyond that, most, most of the Division I sections will cover overall protection to the product, and between that and the general conditions uh, requiring the contractor uh, to deliver everything in a new condition, I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on this. Oh, I do. I do. You do? <laughs> okay. No, and no. Why, no. <laughs> and why is that? <laughs> I want you to use up all the time, so. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You don't get off that easily. I'm sorry. Okay. And the demonstration, I think this goes back to whether or not we're talking about operating equipment. Usually that's where the demonstration is coming into play. Yeah, and usually not gypsum board. Right, and whether or not uh, commissioning may be involved to make sure that the product is actually doing what it says that, or what it claims to be able to do. And again, most times this is going back to equipment, although most recently uh, we're seeing buildings also having envelopes uh, being commissioned, but that's probably not a manufacturer participation. Uh, because the envelope in this case is going to be a, a combination of many different systems compared to a specific product or piece of equipment. And with that, Lewis, look uh -huh. where we made it. Well, part one is closely related to division one specs. And of course, one of the issues is that most manufacturers uh, do not fully understand the use of Division I, and they certainly won't have a copy of the Division I uh, that's, um, that's um, set up for your specific project. And so that being the case, do not be surprised when you see remarks about uh, substitutions and submittals and other things that are in direct conflict with what you've got in your Division One, And as a matter of fact, not only don't be surprised, but we advise you to actively look for those kinds of things. And under the, uh, as they introduce it, we've already kind of talked about this a little bit about uh, looking out for the by other statements because, you know, technically in a legal sense, if you put by others in contract documents, that means not in contract. And of course, that's not what's intended. And we discussed about the concept that many manufacturers have that the spec section is the scope of a subcontract. And I think in some cases, some manufacturers kind of looking out for their installers and trying to protect their installers' interests and try to limit uh, what their installers are, are going to be responsible for. But that's uh, really not the purpose and the meaning of a spec section. Let's go on to the next one, David. OK, I was just going to add oh, go right ahead. Was that uh, one of the things that you can watch for, you had it, one of the last bullet points there is the non-existent sections. Because what, oh, yes. that, 
when manufacturers all the time. Are, right, but when manufacturers are writing this, they have no idea what Division One is going to be, and I usually see a lot of high-level references, like a a level two, yes, uh, Division One spec section. And you may or may not be using that title, but that that would be a giveaway as to where you may want to start checking the spec for conflicts. Now you have to explain to our audience what you mean by level two. Oh dear! <laughs> okay. Gotcha. I, I think level two is it definitely is going to end the section number will end in two zeros, and usually we'll have three zeros. Is where I end up putting level two in division one. Right. In other words, the uh, broad scope sections, although we're really not supposed to use that term anymore. <laughs> I can't believe you just said broad scope. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next article of uh, references is uh, what I often tell people is the most misunderstood article in section format because it really doesn't have any contractual obligations or requirements. Um, I know a lot of uh, people who are not regular specifiers think that if they list enough ASTM and ANSI and other industry standards that if they forgot something somewhere in the body of the spec section that the references section will bail them out in an emergency. And all I can say is if you don't know what's in those each one of those documents, probably not. And the real purpose of the references section is merely to uh, have the bibliographical information uh, for uh, references that are cited later in the, in the spec section by an abbreviated term. So if you say ASTM C150 back in part two, up here in the references, you actually spell out what the full formal title of that document is and who published it and so forth. So anyway, um, um, a lot of um, government agencies like to see those kinds of things, but for most private projects, you can probably skip them. <clears throat> On some metals, let's go to the next slide. Um, this full first bullet is it's kind of one of the things that I feel very strongly about is distinguishing between action and informational submittals. There's a some very important liability. Uh, implications to that and very few manufacturers again are going to help you with that so you're going to have to think that one through yourself and I like to list close out submittals separately it makes it easier for uh, the people that have to administer the contract to be able to come through with those things uh, and then again sometimes you'll see uh, manufacturers will write about the number of uh, submittals or put things in there that, again, conflict with your Division I section on submittals procedures. Let's go on to quality assurance. Sure. And uh, here again, uh, that first bullet is, you know, are we trying to be exclusive? Or are we trying to uh, open this up to uh, more competition to benefit our owner? On the installer qualifications, you know, a lot of manufacturers will sell their goods to uh, uh, two guys and any two guys in a pickup truck, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those two guys are authorized to do warranted installations. So that's something that you need to kind of look at and think about. And uh, do the products need to be combined in a mock-up? Let's go to the next one, please, David. Well, well I was going oh, to I'm ask. Sorry. I was yeah. going to ask Phil if if he finds that manufacturers are often uh, listing the fact that they have installer qualification programs because generally when I'm on their websites or in their product literature that that's not terribly uh, apparent. We find that there are fewer of those out there than you might think. Um, you do in in the in the subscription commercial specification system often have the opportunity to require um, an installer qualification from the manufacturer. Um, and as I say, it's just as easy to include a requirement in a specification as it is to type. 
but whether or not you can actually get what you think uh, is a different matter. What it may mean is that the local rep, who will sell to anybody with a pickup truck, has some letterhead and can issue some kind of letter that looks like what it is you thought you wanted about this particular installer. Now, there are strong exceptions to that. There are manufacturers who have very rigorous um, qualification programs, whether they're you know, uh, certified or the key word also, when there's a warranty involved. Um, they, they do tend to take installer qualifications a little more seriously. But um, we, we find that, that there's, not as, there's not as much of that going on as, as you might, might think or hope. Okay. That, that's what I suspected, but appreciate the comments. On this item, the thing to look out for are statements that get into the contractor's means and methods. And they may be intended by the uh, manufacturer to control the contractor or subcontractor responsibilities and the scope of their work. So uh, again, we kind of they bounce back and forth between being excessively detailed or just comply with ins uh, manufacturer instructions. And of course, warranties are uh, a big issue. We could. One of these days, we may have to do a whole session on just on specifying warranties. That's probably a good idea. Um, but the main thing is not all warranties that you are offered by a manufacturer are to the owner's advantage, and that's the thing to look out. I see we're just about at the end of our time, so we wrapped up pretty well. We did. How did you do that? I cleverly engineered the whole thing and uh, directed it from sunny uh, Nashville here. And yeah, that's how guy, how he guys followed up. my arm waving, exactly. That's how that's he threw his timesheet out at the end of the week, too, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, are, we, we, are, spies we, everywhere. we are honored by uh, all of our attendees. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, we uh, enjoy putting these things on, but we hope that we're giving you some ideas, uh, some starting points uh, for your own work. And David and I, and I'm sure Phil, would be happy to answer questions that you can send to either us directly or to, uh, to Rob, and he'll forward them to us. Uh, if you want to continue the discussion or ask something you know, very specific about what's been presented in this session and last month's session on, on the, this issue. Uh, next month, uh, David and I are probably going to do a session on uh, coordinating drawing notes with specification te terminology. And we'll probably uh, touch base a little bit on keynotes and <clears throat> relationship to BIM and all kinds of good and exciting stuff. So we hope that you will Tune in again on the first Thursday of May. It's and, May 5th. Uh, May 5th and uh, Cinco de Mayo and uh, celebrate uh, Cinco de Mayo with the, uh, Dave and Lewis. <laughs> but you have to come in costume too. <laughs> well, you mean you didn't today? I am. Oh, well, but next month will be a special day and everybody has to come dressed for the occasion. That's right. Okay, so this is Dave too, and I really do appreciate everyone joining us, and we are right up against the hour, and I wanted to just reach out and uh, give a special thanks to Phil for joining us over the last two months and contributing his thoughts from a different perspective from someone that's actually producing uh, many of the manufacturer specs that we are in trying to use, and I know that he's trying to follow all of the suggestions that we're making here. <laughs> I've got a long list, David. Um, do you? And I, I know I I know it's a struggle, Phil, in trying to get some of the manufacturers to listen and to educate them as to what specifiers need. So I give you a lot of credit for being out there and trying to stay in the forefront on that. Well, thank you, and we do work at it, and we think that it's it's one of those places in the industry where you know we can accomplish something, and so we're. 
we're pleased to have the opportunity to do that in our business. And I want to thank uh, you, David, and, and Lewis for the opportunity to join this group the last two months. This has obviously been a great deal of fun for me. Okay, well, great. Look forward to having everybody back with us next month. So we'll see you Cinco de Mayo, May 5th, same time, 3 o'clock.